Thank you, Don, and thank you to the Shakespeare Fellowship, uh, the trustees, the members, and the hardworking contractors who have made this event possible. So uh, my title, this figure that thou here seest put, design as code in the Shakespeare First Folio, is, of course, drawn from the first line of Ben Jonson's epigram, prefixed to the 1623 First Folio, about which Catherine Children and Michael Delahoyd have already given us so much to consider. My title is aspirational, and my aspiration is not to convince you of any particular decoding, but rather to revisit the question of post stratfordian or Oxfordian approach to the concepts of design and code, and their sometimes beautiful relationship in early modern semiotics. Semiotics is the study of signs, and that includes both visual and verbal signs. Ultimately, both visual and verbal signs are code, and to understand them properly requires an investigation of their code-like attributes. So I'm gonna offer here four principles for consideration. The first is context. Context matters. There's an elephant in the living room. And we saw uh, just this afternoon in Alex McNeil's uh, really impressive summary of why there's an authorship question, uh, a little bit about that elephant. So when I say context, I mean all the things that you see on this slide, historical, linguistic, and literary, semiotic, psychological, or biographical, and also scholarly. So um, this is a bit of a repetition. Uh, I, I'm gonna just give three slides here that will give an abbreviated version of what uh, Alex McNeil talked about. And this will be old hat for many of you, but the larger context of our discussion is that the Shakespeare authorship question is very real and a well-recognized topic in the history of ideas. Here is Henry Hallam writing from the mid uh, 18th, 19th century of William Shakespeare whom through the mouths of those whom he has inspired to body forth the modifications of his immense mind, we seem to know better than any human writer. It may be truly said that we scarcely know anything. Now, most people probably don't know who Henry Hallam is, but he is among the most distinguished intellectuals of 19th century Britain, a polymath author of several classic works, including A View of the State of Europe during the Middle Ages, a three-volume constitutional history of England, and the four-volume introduction to the literature of Europe in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. He was the treasurer of the Statistical Society and a founder of it as well, and a very active vice president of the Society of Antiquaries and an honorary professor of history in the Royal Society, among other uh, notable accomplishments. All that insatiable curiosity and unweary diligence have hitherto detected about Shakespeare, he writes, serves rather to disappoint and perplex us than to furnish the slightest illustration of his character. It is not the registry of his baptism or the draft of his will or the orthography of his name that we seek. Uh, uh, no letter of his handwriting, no record of his conversation, no character of him drawn with any fullness by a contemporary has been produced. And just to bring this up to the present, since time of course requires an abbreviation of this history of doubt, um, uh, which many of you are well aware of through the work of uh, Warren Hope, Kim Holston and James Warren, here are some brief quotations from Kevin Gilvari's recent The Fictional Lives of Shakespeare. No new information about Shakespeare has emerged from any contemporary document since 1931. The documents offer no insight into the poet's thoughts and motives. Scarcely any of the claims made about Shakespeare as a writer can be verified by reference to historical records. It is not possible to construct a biography of Shakespeare he remains a complete enigma. But wait, we have this book, right? The book that gave us Shakespeare? The book that proves that Shakespeare was Shakespeare or somebody else of the same name, doesn't it? 
To explore this question, let's look a little more closely and carefully at the book. When we open it, assuming we have a complete copy with all the preliminary leaves in it, this is what we see. Well, what are we looking at? Bibliographical analysis shows that these two pages were among the last printed in the book and some copies are apparently missing them from the start. There's lots to consider here, but let's start with this. In order to place this overlarge engraving of the author on the title page with an unprecedented puffing, which is an unprecedented puffing of an author in 1623, the title page had to be run through two different presses, one for the engraving and one the other for the print. And I, let me here give a shout out to my friend Dorna Buley, who is a real expert on the printing of the first folio. Uh, turning to the 10 line tetrameter epigram, that means there are four iambic feet per line, signed with the initials BI for Ben Johnson, we may ask, well, what are the first words in this book? The first words we can see are to the reader and followed by this figure. The word figure refers to the engraving by Martin Groshout the Younger, a talented young Dutch London printmaker from a printmaking family. And Catherine Chiljan has already given you a pretty good briefing on that image. I'm interested in the word figure. Why figure? Why not picture? Available in print in England from 1476 or portrait available in 1477 or engraving available in 1562. Figure should catch our attention, especially placed so close to the literal beginning of the book. The OED definition takes up almost two pages and supplies 26 possible uses. Figure is among the most important and complicated terms in aesthetics, literary criticism, and the theory of the arts. It's also a very interesting word in Shakespeare. And as you like it, Jacques uses figure to describe his own reflection in a brook. Oh, I was seeking a fool when I found you. He is drowned in the brook. Look but in and you shall see him. There I shall see mine own figure. In Hamlet, the word figure describes the ghost. Bernardo says to Marcellus in the first scene, in the same figure, like the king that's dead. And later to Horatio, he describes the ghost as this portentous figure which comes armed through our watch. So like the king that was and is the question of these wars. And the word is echoed a third time when Horatio transmits the message to Hamlet, describing the ghost as a figure like your father, armed at point exactly capape. It appears before them and with solemn march goes slow and stately by. Now, the members of the watch in these first scenes provide some interesting synonyms. The figure is this thing. It's nothing. It's our fantasy. It is like the king, but it is not the king. In Merchant of Venice, we find the image of an angel stamped in gold. Morocco says they have in England a coin that bears the figure of an angel stamped in gold, but that's in sculpt upon. But here, referring to Portia, an angel in a golden bed lies all within, suggesting that Portia also may be sort of a figure and not a real woman. A figure is also an interesting word in Ben Jonson's own writing. And let me just give you one example here. This is from the Poetaster, where poets dress themselves up as gods and goddesses. And this is to show that poets, in spite of the world, are able to deify themselves. At this banquet to which you are invited, we intend to assume the figures of the gods and give our several loves the forms of goddesses. And we haven't even got to the most interesting part about the word figure, which is figures of speech. Figures of speech are essential to all literary criticism. And in the original Greek, a figure of speech is called a trope 
we, a word that means a turning away from the literal or a way of saying something indirectly. And so these are just a few examples here. We're familiar with many of these pun, simile, irony, understatement, synecdoche, uh, the part for the whole, metonymy, asinus, chiasmus, and euphemism. Most striking of all, oops, this is a little bit out of order. So um, uh, this, is, this is fun. There are, uh, according to the artist here, 27 figures of speech. Time flies when your kingdom's in a nutshell. How many eggs in your basket? If the cat has got your tongue. When you carry some red herrings, make sure you have an ace up your sleeve. Eventually, you're going to kick the bucket anyway. And we could spend some fun time uh, looking at the other ones here, and I could ask you to figure them out, but I think we unfortunately don't have time to do that right now. So let's summarize the uh, word figure in early modern literary discourses. So the root meaning of figure in all these uses is the image, the likeness or representation of something or an imaginary uh, form or phantasm. In literary theory, a figure is a deviation from literal language, such as metaphor, simile, or personification. Thus, in both Shakespeare and Ben Jonson, a figure is a substitute for something real, something that is not the thing itself, but a likely representation of it, a kind of dramatic deceit. So, this is our second lesson after context. Pay attention to small words and all words. The word figure appearing as the second word in this introductory epigram and the second word in the Shakespeare first folio should really induce in us as readers the same doubts as engendered by the appearance of the ghost in Hamlet Sr. on the ramparts in Elsinore among Horatio and the Watch. Is the ghost real? Can we distinguish truth from illusion in the first folio? So my third, the third of my four lessons is study the forms. And I'll explain in a minute, a little more, in a little more detail what I mean by forms, but I really wanna recommend both of these excellent books on this question. If you really wanna know what's going on in early modern poetry, you should check out Alistair Fowler's Triumphal Forms and Mary Douglas's Thinking in Circles. And I'll give you a brief explanation of what they say in there. But first, let's hear from uh, the Bishop of Worcester, the Earl of Worcester in 1st Henry IV, uh, speaking of the conspiratorial and over the top Henry Hotspur. He apprehends a world of figures here, but not the form of what he should attend. Good cousin, give me audience for a while. And the two characters uh, meet uh, and speak together and we cannot hear what they are saying. So while a figure is something transposed or transformed from a more real original, a form is a structure or a set of conventions and it embodies an idea or provides a framework for composition. So let's think about the problem of form, the question of form in Johnson's other poem in the first folio. This is an encomium, a poem of praise. It's 80 lines long. It begins with 16 lines of warning about envy and misinterpretation. And then on line 17, it recommences, I will therefore begin. And we don't have time to talk about this wonderful poem in any detail, but the one thing I want you to pay attention to here that we are gonna cover is that it has a prominent and obvious ceremonial center. Now, this is a concept that is unfamiliar to us. Um, it may seem strange and foreign to modern readers. We are weaned on the ideals of modern free verse. Yet as Douglas and Fowler both show in these two books, its use is ubiquitous in ancient and early modern literature. 
Consider the flood story from Genesis 6.10 through 9.19, one of literally hundreds of narrative episodes, poems, and songs in the Bible, including many, if not all, of the Psalms that follow a similar formal and chiastic pattern. It begins with Noah and his sons, and it also ends with Noah and his sons. The second piece is about all life on earth, and the second to the last is about all life on earth. Uh, the third section coming into it is a curse on earth, and the third section on the other side is a blessing on earth. And right in the middle, pivotally placed, God remembers Noah. First, the waters increase, and God remembers Noah. And then, presumably on account of God remembering Noah, the waters decrease. So the concept of a ceremonial or privilege center is the result of a series of chiastic paired oppositions that are nested around a center. This one being God remembers Noah. So um, here's an example uh, that I'm going to show you, and then we're going to go back to the, to the uh, folio uh, encomium. This is by George Chapman's poem, To Phoebus. It is eight lines long, and we can notice, although we don't have time to do a thorough analysis, the first line is about Phoebus, and the last line is about Phoebus. In the first line, Phoebus is a swan, and in the last line, Phoebus is the king of poesy or poetry. Now, right in the middle, we get this interesting in lines um, four and five, uh, duplication of the pronoun the. Now, this is distinct from the modern all-purpose you. It's not only a form of address to a deity, but it's also the intimate form of the pronoun, reserved for family or intimate friends. Now, the Elizabethan Jacobean tradition of referring to the Earl of Oxford as Phoebus may or may not be relevant here, and I would not at this moment wish to press that understanding too far. But the duplication of the intimate pronoun in the two central lines of this poem readily suggests both the concept of the ceremonial center and the potential use of the center to encode some sort of privileged information, in this case, the privileged information that Chapman uh, is on intimate terms with someone who he calls Phoebus here. So what's the center of Johnson's 80 line first folio encomium? Well, here it is. Uh, the center, the two center lines are triumph my Britain, thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage owe. So the triumphateur has been described here as Shakespeare, but really the triumphateur is Britain. The Britain is the one that is triumphing here. And then the allusion to the contemporary scene of the proposed Spanish marriage negotiations to marriage Charles I to the Infanta of Spain is fairly clear. Charles and Buckingham, while in Spain during the months that the folio was being printed, were treated to many triumphs during the courtship. Uh, he returned to England in October, weeks at most before the folio was for sale in the St. Paul bookstores. Our Shakespeare, Johnson seems to suggest, is a show. Well, what does he mean by show? Well, before we get to that question and answer it, let's talk a little bit more about what a triumph is. Um, the concept of a literary triumph originates in the Roman triumph and other ancient forms, which all privilege the center, just as these poems do, as the place for the one who is triumphant. And as I already said, in this place, Britain is really the triumphator because it has a Shakespeare to show. But here in this slide is how Professor Demaray accounts for the form in the Shakespeare first folio. In the well-known dedicatory verse to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, introducing the 1623 folio of Shakespeare's plays, paid tribute to Shakespeare using a curious 
and generally neglected metaphor. Johnson, in praising the playwright and the British theater, presents Shakespeare as a participant in a triumph, a theatrical form characterized by the surprise entry and revelatory unmasking of disguised aristocrats. Now, I hasten to clarify that Professor Demaray would probably be object to being cited in this context, at least at first. But for me, this quote was a torch in a dark night. So I said, what does Johnson mean by show? Well, he doesn't use the word obviously in the same way all the time, but here is his expostulation with Inigo Jones, the set designer with whom he both collaborated and had a huge falling out with. Oh, shows, shows, mighty shows, the eloquence of masks. What need of prose or verse or sense to express immortal you? You are ye spectacles of state. Tis true, court hieroglyphics. So I submit to you that there's a, a strong case to be made that Johnson's use, use of show in the first folio encomium is highly ironic. He's saying that Shakespeare is a thing for show, uh, not a real person, not a real writer. There is, however, at least one good precedent for Ben Johnson's use of the word figure to describe the Drozhout. These are verses um, by Thomas DeLay or possibly someone named Mal Herb. I am not entirely clear on this point, but they are, uh, whoever they are, are by, they are written to accompany the engraving of Montaigne in Montaigne's essays, a work that left a profound and durable imprint in Shakespeare as Ben Jonson would have known. So with help from Elizabeth Wagaman, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I have been able to determine the force and significance, or we, she helped me both on the translation and also the discussed the implications, uh, the significance of the word figure in this poem. I'm not going to try to read the French. Here is of the great Montaigne, a complete figure. The painter painted the body and Montaigne revealed his marvelous mind. The painter by his art equals nature, but Montaigne surpasses that art in everything that he writes. So there are two main points worth insisting on here. First, the use of the French word for figure in this well-known illustration of a man um, uh, that all literate Englishmen of the late 16th century knew and admired seems unlikely to be a coincidence. Instead, everything points to Johnson having the Montaigne dedicatory epigram in his mind as he composed his own in the first folio. The parallelism between the two epigrams is reinforced by the prominent role of the two key terms, art and nature, in both. Now, I'm not saying that Johnson may not have also had other pretexts in mind as he wrote but I think this one must definitely be included among them. A little consideration will show that Johnson has not only modeled his epigram on Montaigne's, but that understanding the model helps to place Johnson's intentions in the foreground. In this epigram, the art of the painter and the writing of Montaigne conspire to produce a complete figure. That is to say the visual image complements and completes the intellectual and spiritual resources of Montaigne's own essays. The epigram it affirms a wholeness and a completeness that is the result of having both the image and the words of the man. Johnson's poem is the opposite of this. Here, the word figure does not complete the artistic values of the literary work, but is set in place of them, in competition with them. The engraver we see in the third and fourth lines was forced into a struggle between art and nature. This struggle symbolizes the struggle within Johnson to reconcile art and nature when the task involves purposeful and to his thinking anyway, legitimate deceit. Thus, we may conclude 
that at least one proper sense of the phrase design as code refers to a very special kind of design, the design by the systematic practice of grounding a contemporary meaning in a context that includes a living precedent. So this is lesson number four, and I'm almost done here. Um, uh, compare the texts. Early modern writers were trained to read in a comparative fashion, and this is a 16th century engraving of a, something called a book wheel. It was used by opening all the books placed on it to pages dealing with the same topic so that the scholar could see what each of these books had to say about whatever subject he or she was interested in. If we don't read early modern texts comparatively, we will miss the code. So just to wrap this up, on one slide, here's my comparison between the Montaigne, the, uh, the epigram on Montaigne and the epigram on Johnson. In the Montaigne, the entire figure is composed of two parts of the work, the two parts, the work and the engraving of the author. Visual art and poetics are integrated and complementary. Art equals nature and Montaigne, the writer, surpasses art. It's a high compliment. What Johnson says about Shakespeare is that the figure is put in place of or on behalf of the author. Johnson posits a disequilibrium between the visual and the poetic. Art in his poem is in strife with nature and the engraver struggles to outdo the life with a necessary illusion, a figure. So in conclusion, these are my four rules of thumb for reading form as code. Read the context, notice small words and all words and think about what they mean in their contemporary context, study the forms in their contemporary context and compare the relevant texts. So um, for more information, uh, please consider visiting uh, my website, uh, shakespearesbible.com. And I'm going to put, if I can figure out how to do it here, um, I think I have to um, end my share to get to the chat and I will put these two links into the chat. Um, I welcome you to visit. My website has been down for a number of years and I'm very excited to have it back up and available as a resource uh, for our movement. Thank you for your attention and check out the chat for those links.